and you know, even in my professional career, I've always found that by having an empathy for people has mm. served me well in, in getting things done. You know, I've run very large uh, resources projects in the hundreds of millions of dollars. Um, but yeah. at the end, it doesn't come down to the nuts and the bolts and the engineering. It comes down to the people who are on that team and how you can extract best performance from them. Welcome to all listeners to yet another episode of Tech Society. Today we have with us Phil Turtle, the National President of the Australia Indonesia Business Council. Their mission is to promote and build the trade and investment relationship between Australia and Indonesia. We chat to him about a decade-long pursuit which has paid off on the day of our recording, the 9th of July 2020, covering the free trade agreement between the two countries. We also ask him about entrepreneurship and the startup culture in Indonesia and learn about how he grew to love the country. Hey guys. Hey Phil. Hey, Phil. All right. Well, yeah. Do you want to just tell us about a little bit about yourself and about what what you do oh. with the Australian Indonesia Business Council? Sure. Um, well, I'm Phil Turtle. I have the great pleasure to be the national president of the Australian Indonesia Business Council. Uh, we're you know obviously a business organisation. We've got a, a branch or a chapter in every state and territory in Australia, but we also work very closely with counterparts in Indonesia, represented in in five cities there. So, um, you know, we're very much a, a business group. You know, we've got very broad membership from very large corporates to, to small micro, micro businesses in just about every sector that you could imagine. Um, and, you know, we, we'd like to enjoy what we do, you know, doing business with our Asian counterparts. A lot of it is about um, the, the relationships that we build. Mm-hmm. Um, often they're built in informal settings, um, getting to know people over a period of time. So we make sure that everything we do has a, a sense of, of fun and theatre to it. So um, I'm very much looking forward to this conversation today. <laughs> cool. Can you explain well, what you mean by uh, fun and theatre? I like that. Um, well, I, I <laughs> guess, uh, look, in, in whatever business you're in, the business you're in too, you know, mm. everything's competitive. You know, mm. we, we are always uh, uh, competing for our, our, our attention of our members and people that get involved in our organisation. And, you know, if we're not constantly innovating, reinventing ourselves, putting on interesting, entertaining events that capture people's uh, attention, then, you know, people lose interest pretty quickly and get attracted to other other things to do. There's always a, a million things. So we're always very conscious that, that we need to always be, um, you know, again, getting back to the word of innovating in everything we do and, and, and paying attention to small details. And I, I guess that total customer experience um, in interacting with us. So, um, you know, that's, mm. and again, a lot of that is by creating environments where people are enjoying themselves, are being entertained. And if people are enjoying themselves, they, they will network more effectively. It break down, breaks down a lot of those barriers that, that sometimes, you know, inhibit people. So it just creates an environment in which things can happen. Brilliant. I like that. So I'd like to ask you, sorry, Alex. Yeah, no, no, go ahead. Go ahead John. <laughs> as, the, as the national president of the uh, Australian Indonesia Business Council, what were the steps that happened before that? You know, why, why Indonesia, why Asia? What, what happened to make you come up all this way and then represent Australia in this, in this kind of environment? Well, you know, I guess looking back, I'd almost suggest it might have been my destiny, my calling to do these things. <laughs> Um, okay. But, you know, look, my background, I'm, I'm a, an engineer by profession. You know, I've always been interested in engineering, technology, science. You know, I had the good mm. fortune. My, my dad worked for Qantas growing up. So I spent most of my life at airports watching airplanes, wondering how they worked or, or flying on them. Mm. Um, so, you know, I, I developed that as a profession. I studied aeronautical engineering initially, then, then mechanical engineering. Uh, have been work, worked in my young years in, in mining and resources, worked offshore, subsea engineering, some really interesting exotic stuff, you know, in, you, in your space of software development. You know, I was a young nerd and I hope you don't find that offensive, but, you know, I spent <laughs> way too much of my early life at university, um, you know, teaching myself assembler uh, programming mm, and C++, Java, blah, whatever. 
Um, you know, I now employ people to do those things for me because <laughs> I, I can't keep up with the rate of change in, in your industry. It's, you know, I'm just happy as an engineer, the laws of physics generally stay static over the centuries. So a bridge is a bridge is a bridge. Um, mm. But, you know, having, having worked in that environment and having traveled a lot, you know, I was fortunate again with my, with my dad and family, we traveled a lot when I was young uh, and spent time in Asia. So I'd you know, visited Bali back in the, in the early eighties and Hong Kong and Singapore and other places, but was just fascinated by other cultures and experiences. You know, I've always been hyperactive and, and looking for extra stimuli. Um, so to be stuck at home and just hanging out with the people, you know, uh, just doesn't do it for me. So I've, I, I guess for myself, I'm someone who's always ironically been uncomfortable in my comfort zone. Uh, you know, I, I like to be challenged all the time. Um, and, you know, in the world of mining, uh, a lot of projects are, are in the Asian region. Uh, I had, again, had the good fortune to spend a year working in the, in the jungles of, uh, of Eastern Malaysia in, in Sarawak uh, on a very large wow. international LNG project. Um, but I was the only Westerner around uh, the township because most of my uh, colleagues were with US companies. They all worked in the compound, which looked more like a prison, like Guantanamo Bay or something like that. They caught the bus out of the compound in the morning and took the bus back to the compound in the evening, where I immersed myself in the local uh, community. I enjoyed the food, the culture, all of those things. And, you know, again, it always enjoyed uh, Asia. Uh, it makes a lot of sense and had always been looking for an opportunity to, to go back, I, I guess. And mm. you know, I, was, I was working with some of the, the larger international engineering construction firms. I was doing very well. I kind of thrived in that environment as well, but jumped out of that and joined a, a Chinese company uh, based in Singapore and, you know, back and forward between Singapore and Perth and China and Hong Kong and, and uh, but spent a lot of time in Indonesia. And, and when I first went to Indonesia, I did not want to go to Indonesia um, because like a lot of Australians, you know, many of whom don't even know that Bali is part of Indonesia. Um, I guess, you know, you read the headlines, you know, about getting sick with Bali belly. It's about bogan tourists. It's about terrorists. It's about yeah. you know, dictatorships. It's about this, 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 you know, all of these mm. negative stereotypes that continually reinforce in our media, which are complete baloney or in other words, starting with B. Um, and it was only because you can I say was. That nice, <laughs> well, okay, I was bullshit then. Um, so, you know, I, you know, I was made to go kicking and screaming. Um, and when I got there, it took me about five minutes to realise all of my perceptions were wrong. Mm. You know, I, I turned up in Jakarta, a thriving metropolis, amazing architecture. You know, glitzy, thri you know, thriving, high energy, twenty-four hour a day, seven day a week metropolis and i mm -hmm. thought oh okay maybe i'll just keep quiet and just take this all in and and i guess you know i've having spent a fair bit of time in in those in in parts of indonesia and in other parts of asia uh you know I, it just convinced me that that's where i belonged um and really it was just through doing business building my networks uh talking to people uh, i was introduced to the business council and i went along to my first event um and I met some really interesting people and thought, well, hang on, this is a really good environment. If I'm, I'm passionate about these things, I'll, I'm going to connect. So I, I put my membership money on the table and sort of said, well, okay, now what do I do? Um, because I'm also not somebody who ever likes just to make up the numbers for the sake of it. You know, if I'm going to be involved in an organisation or an enterprise, it has to be in a role where I can make a difference and have a voice. So from my very early days, you know, I worked up through the, the committee um, here in Western Australia, you know, became vice chairman, chairman, did that for four years, uh, sitting on the national board at that time, and then through the, the progression of vice president and, and, and then president, which I've been doing for three years now. But um, as you can probably tell, I'm, I'm very enthusiastic about it. I'm very <laughs> passionate about what so, we do. It's really cool. But my question is, since, the, since you're on this, this thing, uh, do you live more of your life in Australia or Indonesia? Well, we're still predominantly here, you know, or particularly mm. at the moment, because I'm stuck in my bedroom <laughs> pretty much. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, but, you know, I, I would normally travel to Indonesia 
um, you know, seven or eight times a year, predominantly to Jakarta, but sometimes other other parts and mm. slowly uh, working my way around. You know, I had the good fortune just this last Christmas to have a, a holiday um, in, in eastern Indonesia and with Komodo Islands and around Labuan Bajo. So I got to see the, the Komodo oh, dragons cool. and stuff, yeah. which, was, which was pretty cool. And, you know, Indonesia is a, a beautiful uh, country, um, really, uh, you know, and, and on that, everybody knows Bali. Uh, <laughs> Indonesia is quite keen to develop 10 new Bali so it can str- spread the love a bit and so travellers can sample other parts of the, of the country. Um, yeah, yeah, okay. It's a bit of a culture shock when you move from Bali to Indonesia, I think. People don't expect it. The language, the language is the same, but culture changes quite a lot. Uh, absolutely. You know, I think, I, I can't remember, I think it's something like 350 different ethnic groups, I think, in Indonesia. You know, when you look at the differences, you know, from, from Papua, uh, which is obviously very much like New Guinea, very uh, you know, very dark skinned, um, mm. people, you know, right up to the, the northern tip of Aceh, you know, such diversity all the way through the 17,000 islands in the archipelago. And I guess it's through that. And even from a business perspective, you know, the nuances of dealing with different cultural groups in Indonesia, you know, where when you look at the Javanese who are generally very soft and gentle and very non-confrontational um, to other, other uh, groups, you know, the Bataks who are much more forceful and, and forthright in, in, in voicing their opinions. I think Australians sometimes find them easier to deal with because they're, they're more like us, I suppose. Um, but, but to have success in Indonesia, you know, you have to be sensitive to those differences. And, you know, and, and again, in my vocabulary, the most important word is respect. You know, if, if you're respectful for people, um, you know, you'll, you'll find you'll be accepted well, even if you do make some, you know, cultural faux pas, et cetera, you know, you'll generally be forgiven. But, but sometimes uh, Australians can be uh, quite aggressive and loud and uh, want to be a know-it-all and be arrogant. <laughs> and, and, and that's probably not a great, um, you know, image to be projecting and, and not a great recipe for success uh, in Indonesia or, or probably any of the Asian cultures you know really mm. it's not a it's not a well, great anyway really yeah. well exactly well, that's americans, the point i was going to make i think americans will um, appreciate that they they like that oh, yeah, gung ho style yeah. yeah the what's the what's the biggest mistakes you see australians make well what well, uh, oh, well, yeah, that's yeah. one of them <laughs> um that's a, a pretty fundamental one but i i guess it's it's being um, very transactional, which is kind of related to that first one. You know, you, know, you really, you, you need to put the importance of building the relationships, genuine relationships, uh, front, front, right at the front. And, mm-hmm. you know, you get to know people over a period of time, have patience, have persistence. And over time, you'll get to know each other well, trust each other well enough to do business. And, and then things happen. And I guess, in a way, it's related back to what we were talking about. You know, creating an environment in which good things can, can happen rather than try to be too pushy and, and, and impose yourself on, on people. How do you make that move that, um, well not move, but an Australian business person who's looking at Indonesia and thinking, I would like to do something there. What's the first Mm. step? Well, I guess the first step is a, is a low cost one and, and perhaps fits the current situation well is, you know, Google's a wonderful resource. You know, you can find, you know, you can find out an awful lot about other countries um, just by research, mm. but then only as a step before a physical immersion. You know, a lot of the work I do, apart from the work I do with a council, I do run my own business as well which is, is helping mm. businesses go into Indonesia and other Asian markets. So, you know, apart from doing some upfront research, um, you know, really, you, you've got to go there. Mm. And, you know, and I, I, that's often what I'll do. So a, a new client, I might, might do a little bit of work um, with, you know, upfront and say, well, look, here's some information on, on the culture, on, on the way of doing business, on, on the food, on, you know, lots of different things. But say, look, until you've gone to you know, Jakarta or other places until you've been stuck in the horrific traffic, until you've got <laughs> a terrible dose of barley belly, until you've sucked in that terribly polluted air, until you've um, experienced jam karet, which is the Indonesian term for rubber time. And, you know, because in the business community in Indonesia, it's not uncommon 
uh, for meetings to start an hour, two hours late. You know, sometimes they get cancelled mm. altogether. Um, but you just kind of have to go with the flow and accept that things will happen at their at their pace. And again, if you're too impatient and 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 don't dress, and, and it's funny when in my first uh, trip to Indonesia, again, you know, my background's engineering, so I'm I'm used to structure and and <laughs> timeliness yeah. and things like that. And my first visit really, yeah, I loved it, but it did my head in because yeah, I experienced those things of frustration with meetings being cancelled or delayed and all these other factors. Now, you know, it's almost like I have this switch that um, when I'm here at home in Perth, I have a certain environment that I work in and I'm programmed for that. Then I flick my Indonesia switch. I get on the Garuda jet um, and I fly to Indonesia and I'm kind of, you know, in, you know, I have a different sensitivity to those things. And, you know, and sometimes when the, the plane's running late or it, the plane parks 10, seemingly 10 miles away from the terminal and you've got to get this bus and then another bus and then this and this, I just smile and think I'm back. I'm, I'm here in <laughs> Indonesia. This is, this is what it is. And, and for business, and unless you can deal in that environment where there's constant flexibility, a constant state of flux, frustration, and unless you can embrace that and almost make it work for you, it's going to be pretty difficult. So, so when people now ask me, Phil, how do, you, how do you go in that traffic, that terrible traffic in Jakarta? I say, I love it. I get in the back of my nice, comfortable Mercedes taxi. I get mm. myself a copy of the Jakarta Post. I make myself comfortable. I read the paper. I look out the window. I know I'm going to get to where I'm going when I get there. And every day I look out that window and I see something remarkable, something I've never seen before, whether it's 10, 10 people and a couple of chickens on a, on a motorcycle or, or something else. Um, there's always something amazing and interesting to see. Speaking of that, Indonesia now has quite a burgeoning startup culture, right? I, Absolutely. We've, we've talked to a few people about it. And in fact, we, we even uh, have, I wouldn't say worked with, but we've assisted some uh, Indonesians, uh, uh, an Indonesian startup doing some really cool stuff. What do you think of the Indonesian like tech startup scene? Oh. It's, it's thriving. You know, as mm. I was on another webinar today, uh, launching a new trade agreement between our countries. And, you know, one of our uh, members is Coca-Cola Amatol, quite a large company, but they mm. have their own accelerator for, for tech and startup called Amatol X. And, and again, their CEO was reflecting that, that Jakarta is seen as the, the startup hub of Southeast Asia now. And, and just looking at some of the stats, you know, they talk about uh, Jakarta just really ranking behind behind only the United States, India, England, and Canada. Wow, so apart from those communities, it has a more good. active startup environment than that. And mm. you know, all of the, the international VCs are in Indonesia. You know, you've got the 10 cents, the Alibabas, the SoftBanks, wow. all in there, the Coca-Colas, all putting money into this. It's encouraged by the government. You know, and again, just looking at some of the stats of Indonesia, now it's got a, a population of 270 million, 130 mm odd million internet users, 130 million social medias, 180 mobile phone users and, and 120 million uh, social. And, and, you know, with the infrastructure, you can imagine that in, in an archipelago of 17,000 islands, um, a lot of the communication relies on mobile telephony. So mm. forget about landlines. Right. Everybody has two or three smartphones. They're all on their WhatsApp, their Twitter, their Instagram, mm. uh, whatever. And, you know, in Indonesia, only 30% of the workforce is in what you would consider conventional employment. Everybody else is a, an entrepreneur. You have to be to survive. So <laughs> yeah. you know, whether it's buying a, a bottle of plastic, a plastic bottle of water from the guy over there and then going to the street corner and selling it and make a, a few thousand rupiah in the transaction, that, that's how people survive. So, um, you know, much of Indon Indonesia is naturally entrepreneurial. Um, you know, and they talk about, you know, again, when you look at the rankings, there was a figure of 2,193 startups in Indonesia. You know, I, I wouldn't be surprised if it was 10 or 100 times that because, you know, a lot of the uh, population are really not on the grid. So mm. there could be so much that when I say not on the grid, they are on the grid in terms of their mobile phone and stuff. But I mean, they're not connected with the conventional, you know, sort of society that we would imagine here. Um, so a, a lot goes on under the radar and, you know, when you look at, again, those startups, you know, Indonesia now 
with five unicorns, one of them a decacorn, um, you know, Gojek, which is kind mm. of Indonesia's Uber on steroids. Yeah. You, know, you can go anything. Uber um, for everything, yeah. Well, it is, and it's just yeah. staggering. So all of those apps and um, and the like. And, you know, uh, you know there's, I, I think of a guy like Ridwan Kamil, who's West Java's uh, governor. Yeah, you know, West Java alone has got fifty million people, so it's got twice of a, twice Australia's population in one one province. Um, and his agenda, he's he's got great presidential ambitions anyway. So he's a man of the people. Mm. But through technology, he's trying to raise his community up out of poverty. Um, you know, through uh, you know apps, you know tech apps and financial services, uh, licensing, streamlining, and of course. A lot of these automated process inherently also reduce the, the likelihood of corruption, which which you know most people would recognise has been a problem uh, in Indonesia. So, you know, a lot of the agencies are using tech um, to streamline all of those uh, financial services and other processes. And just to show how that's embraced, uh, you know, the the former head of Indonesia's Young um, Entrepreneurs Association has now been elevated to head the Indonesia Investment Coordinating Board. So he's, he's now in charge of all foreign and domestic investment across the country. Mm-hmm. And the, the Gojek founder is now um, Indonesia's education minister because they've recognised that young, new ways of learning and doing things are the future of education. So he's been brought in to disrupt the conventional thinking on, on education, how young people are brought up. Uh, through that sort of skills development. They launched the the Gojek Academy. I think they're very, very motivated to increase the tech learning Mm. and actually create a a culture of software development. It's it's really, really cool. Really cool Mm. stuff they're doing there. The Blue Academy, sorry. Yeah, it's incredible what's what's going on. Mm. And, And I think... The culture is ripe, as you say, because you, you know, here in Perth, we can be safe. We can get a job for working for a mining company and make really good money and never have to worry about much, uh, especially not the stress of starting a business or, or even, even harder, a, a, a startup idea, you know, mm-hmm. entrepreneur, but in Indonesia, there's, yeah, you, you've, you've, You've got have to less be one. safety. Yeah. You have to be one to survive. Yeah. I'm not saying way. it's a good thing, but I'm saying it's ripe for, for that kind of culture. It creates, it creates innovation. It creates unexpected emerg- emergent mm. solutions to things, I think. And uh, on that, I'm actually curious about your thoughts on the move of Jakarta's, I mean, Indonesia's capital to mm. East Kalimantan. So uh-huh. are there any cool... Wow. startups kind of working on looking into that or uh, opportunities that people are like looking into? Well, I'm sure they are, you know, with this COVID situation, um, you know, I, I, you know, that, that move to the new capital is probably would have been paused. Like, well, it's probably yeah. been paused. You know, I do get conflicting reports on, on its progress, but mm. you know, that that's an exciting project. You know, it's, it's something which, you know, before COVID was really attracting a lot of attention from international that's... players, you know, it's not, yeah not every day of the week that a, a city, the fourth largest country in the it's world um, says, Oh, I'm going to move my capital city, but <laughs> it's also it's li- highly unusual, isn't it? Well, so, well it is. It's a, a bit of a problem that Jakarta is kind of sinking into the it's ocean. sinking. Yeah. So, <laughs> um, so it, it kind of drives innovation in, in that way too, doesn't it? Um, so, you know, and again, you know, the, the new city is, is going to be green green mm. energy, novel transport solutions, um, smart city concepts, transportation, you know, electric vehicles. So, you know, everything that's that new, that's new and exciting can find a place in that new city. So I, yeah. I think that's why a lot of people are excited about it. And, you know, we, we've had a lot of interest from, you know, urban planners, architects, energy provider, yeah, renewables particularly, uh, and other businesses who are, positioning themselves you know it's it's really been going through the master planning stages etc um so we'll we'll see how that how we'll be keeping a very close eye on 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 how that progresses because you know again with this new agreement between australia and indonesia we would hope that that would be a lever um to see a, a real place for australian 
um, you know, smarts uh, an enterprise to, to play a part. So, so yes. can you can you tell us a bit more about that agreement? Well, it, well, the agreement has been more than a decade in the making. It's a it's cool. a it's a free <laughs> trade agreement plus plus, and I've been involved in it, you know, for ten years. So I was a very young man when I started. Wow. Um, but you know the <laughs> That's the cool. uh, well uh, yeah. well uh, the. The premise is, you know, mm. it's an agreement that reduces the, the duties and tariffs for a whole range of goods between the countries. As of now, as of this Sunday, um, yep. any Indonesian products can enter Australia duty-free. So no duty on oh. any Indonesian products. Um, yeah, there's still the other licensing requirements, particularly of food products and things. You know, as you'd imagine, Australia has some pretty stringent biosecurity rules and things like that. So, you know, it's not just a matter of opening the, the door and everything comes in, but, you know, working on a whole lot of uh, new Indonesian products to come in. Electric vehicles, which I mentioned, is one that uh, Indonesia has great ambition for. Um, mm. you know, they've, they've designed their own electric vehicles and, and, and you know, they'll, they'll find more of a place. And with this agreement, there's preferential rules to allow Indonesian electric vehicles to find their way ultimately onto an Australian roads. Wow. And, and yet, when you think about it, whilst that hasn't all come together, you know, here in Perth and Western Australia, we talk a lot about battery minerals, all the lithium and, and good, yeah. good things we've got here. Uh, and a lot of people are talking about how we can marry that up with Indonesian manufacturing capability, you know, to create a sort of integrated supply chain where you might take Australian raw materials and automotive design expertise, which we still have despite cutting off our uh, our local automotive Our industry. Yeah, exactly. Um, so look, there's uh, you know again, there's a lot of elements that can potentially be pulled together to see Australia and Indonesia work well in that because the the agreement. Um, allows us, you know, there's relaxed investment rules between the countries, uh, different quotas on, on, you know, the traditional cattle and grains and, mm -hmm. and other, other things. In education, you know, our universities are, are looking at establishing uh, bricks and mortar operations in Indonesia. But the real exciting uh, part is the, uh, um, the stimulation for three-way opportunities for Australia you know, rather than Australia and Indonesia just to buy and sell stuff to each other and from each other is work together and develop products that they can sell to all of ASEAN or all of the world. Um, and there are some examples of that. You know, you know some of you, you know, may have seen ads for steel blue work boots, for instance, you know, mm. designed here in Western Australia, manufactured in Jakarta, exported to the world. There's kitchen equipment, there's fishing lures. There's a whole range of, of stories like that. Um, but there's tremendous opportunity for Australia and Indonesia, you know, rather than uh, competing with each other or just buying and selling stuff to each other, they actually work together and, and can really do some pretty special things. With um, COVID-19 and, uh, you know, how that's affected China's supply chain, do you see that having a, a positive effect on uh, Indonesia's manufacturing capabilities? And... and, uh, and uh, the size of their manufacturing industry. Hmm. Well, I, I think the, the the trade tensions with some of our largest mm. trading partners, mm. you know, make people look at alternatives, or you know, you know, and not necessarily to replace uh, the existing market with China, um, but you know, as a an addition and and mm. as a hedge, I suppose, against putting all your eggs in one basket. So, you know, internationally, we've seen a number of uh, manufacturing companies pull out of China and relocate to Indonesia, but other ASEAN countries as well, to Malaysia, to, to Vietnam. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, certainly from our point of view, anything that uh, causes business to look to Indonesia uh, is a good thing. Um, and, you know, even well before these uh, trade tensions, you know, that's what we've been advocating has been, you know, it doesn't make sense for business just to have, you know, all of your trade going to one country. There are other markets, and this is a pretty big one. Um, and, you know, this, this agreement as well, we see as a great head turner, you know, really something that we can wave around and, and get people to look at Indonesia. And, and, you know, when we've traveled to Indonesia in developing this agreement, you know, we talk to people, you know, they, they talk about the lack of trust and, un, trust and understanding between the countries. But Indonesian, our Indonesian friends also say they, you know, not you know, figuratively, not literally. They they get say they get sick of watching out us fly over Jakarta to get to China. Um, <laughs> so you know, and, and when you think about it, you know, four of our major shipping routes that take our iron ore and coal and other products to China sail through Indonesian waters. 
So, you know, it really is a case to, to look more seriously in Indonesia anyway. It's interesting because I do realize, I, I remember a time when I was trying to fly to Bandung and I had to go through Bali, then Jakarta, then take a three or four hour drive. Mm -hmm. So I do know that flying to Bali is very easy as a tourist. Flying to the rest of Indonesia is a little harder. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I, hope, I hope that we get more, more flights to more cities uh, directly yeah. from Perth since we're so close. Yeah. And just so everyone gets the opportunity to explore the rest of the country as well. Yeah. Well, it is a frustration. You know, I think a lot of people have been, um, you know, bemoaning the fact that it is quite limited. But I guess, you know, airline, airlines have been hammered through COVID anyway. Oh, but I mean, sure, yeah. any other time still, you know, it still comes, comes down to how, you know, how many people use the services. So, yeah. you know, there's been quite fluctuating service between Perth direct to Jakarta and with mm. different airlines and stuff. It's just really difficult for the airlines to justify opening up some of those other routes. You know, I know mm. out of, out of Northern territory, you know, they talk about flying into West Timor and other, other parts of, uh, of Indonesia, but you know, I, I think it's, uh, you know, it's an ambition. Uh, it's just <laughs> not going to happen overnight, but it, you know, yeah. I think we're going to be stuck with, uh, some of that frustration, but you know, we're from Perth. We've got wonderful. We did have wonderful '99 uh, Air Asia trips to Lombok, which I made use of at Christmas time. So, um, and I guess Indonesia still is, you know, it's it's not a frontier uh, country, but I mean, you know, it, it's it isn't that easy to get around. Mm. Uh, and I guess if you're up for that, you know, some wonderful experiences to be to be had. Just to go back to your history. That day you first arrived in Indonesia for the first time, mm -hmm. uh, how did you get from there to this point <laughs> where you now have a large network in Indonesia, you, you know, you're almost a, an honorary Indonesian? Well, well pretty much. I, that, well, I, I'm very fortunate because, you know, what, what's guided me through my career, I suppose, has been a, a love of people and their stories. And I, and I guess, you know, I, I, I thank my dad very much for that because, you know, he was in management with the airline and, you know, just watching the way he operated and, and how he treated everybody the same. It didn't matter what job they had, you know, whether they're the premier of the state or the guy that drove the truck at the airport or whatever, you know, treated them all again with respect and was interested in their story. Um, and, you know, even in my professional career, I've always found that by having an empathy for people, has served me well in, in getting things done. You know, I've run very large uh, resources projects in the hundreds of millions of dollars, um, but yeah. at the end, it doesn't come down to the nuts and the bolts and the engineering. It comes down to the people who are on that team and how you can extract best performance from them. You know, not in a cynical way, but in a genuine way. But, you know, and through that in my, in my travels, you know, because I do have that sense of, curiosity and wonder you know when I was traveling I'd always be talking to people and always building relationships and networks and it kind of just comes with the with the territory so I'm very fortunate um, the people I hang out with you know I've got some wonderful friends who do a whole range of things um, and uh, it, it is very fortunate that I you know for, for myself and for my clients and whoever uh, I'm able to share those relationships and um, and help people on their journey, you know, and again, one of the things we're very passionate about in our organization is our younger professionals coming up through, uh, you know, there's a lot of people who uh, come up through university with real interests in Asia and, and business and things, but it can be quite difficult to find opportunities. But again, we have an internship program and mentorship program and a young professionals group within our organization, again, to encourage uh, younger professionals, give them a platform, some profile, help them actively to build their own networks. Um, because, yeah, I, I used to get, I used to say young people were the future. And I remember getting pulled up on that one time. I, I was introducing a young colleague of mine to a university, uh, to, sorry, to an audience. And I said, oh, yes, and here's um, my young colleague, Anthony. Uh, you know, he's, he's the future of this organization. And he stopped me and he said, well, Phil, with respect, we're the now of this organization. And I said, you know what? He's got a bloody good point. Um, and it's absolutely true, you know, particularly in the sort of startup and tech space. You know, I, I, I think back, you know, one of our very good um, members in Indonesia is a joint venture between Telstra um, and, and Telcom, the Indonesian equivalent Telco. And we, we had a forum with Telcom Telstra um, in Jakarta late last year. And one of their senior executives, a, a lady out of Singapore, 
um, was mentioning how she had an appointment to go and see, uh, oh, I, I can't remember if it was Traveloka or Tokopedia, one of, one of Indo Indonesia's unicorn businesses. So she was telling the story how she you know, turned up in her power suit and was ready to meet the executives <laughs> of this organization. I went into the boardroom and it was all young guys in their sneakers and hoodies and stuff. And she said, oh God, you know, I'm completely out of place here. Um, so, you know, th these days, young people are now. Ah, there's no denying that. So, um, again, I, I, my own philosophy is if I can give a young person a start in their career, a, a, a leg up or whatever, I'm delighted to do it. And then I just step back and get the hell out of the way and, and let them flourish. Uh, and that's very, very satisfying and rewarding to see that happen. On the, um, the, cons the topic of the tech startup scene in Jakarta or Indonesia in general, what's 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 encouraging the culture over there uh, you know, there's this vc but what about the education of future programmers or future hackers yeah. and engineers well I think what's happening there well it's interesting I, some of my very dear friends are, are located in the the special regency of jock jakarta which is still run by a sultan mm -hmm. um jock jakarta oh, wow. is very much a university city it's got some of the top universities in indonesia Gajamada university and a range of others where a lot of australian students go to go to study under the new colombo plan and other other things and you know they had a huge hacker culture um mm. and a lot of international companies have gone in there and said well we'll have you and you and you and you and maybe instead of hacking you can actually do some game development for us so i think cool. uh, game loft uh, you guys may know of game loft i i hadn't heard of them but there are some live you know pixar do mm -hmm. a lot of their work in Indonesia. So particularly around Jok Jakarta and Bandung and Jakarta, where you said there's a real concentration of very smart young developers and the like doing a range of range of smart things. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, it is, you know, I, I just think it's the thing to do. You know, I think young people are attracted to tech and, you know, cause I just see that transforming their own lives. You know, they everything is an app. So, so how do we connect tech cultures from different countries now that we're talking about the free trade agreement we've got yeah. exports and imports but now we're talking about you know people so so and, what happens there well john you can be part of that so that's, you know, that's why i'm guess, asking so <laughs> well that's what it is because you know with all of this there's a framework there and that can be exploited but it really is down to individuals making an effort to do something mm -hmm. um you know there's there's various channels that you can um, explore, you know, as an example, I'm doing some work with the city of Perth at the moment, and they're uh, developing a memorandum of, of understanding with the city of Denpasar in Bali. But that's around creative economy, about startups, co-working spaces. And you talk mm. about what's driving innovation. You know, the proliferation of co-working spaces around Jakarta and other cities is phenomenal. Um, you know, I hosted an event with some of our cybersecurity and education guys in Jakarta last December. And when I asked the embassy, um, if they'd host us at the embassy, they said, well, look, we can, but maybe you'd like to do it in a, one of the new co-working environments in Jakarta, which we did That's this cool. place called Greenhouse oh, awesome. yeah. in this whole top floor of this uh, city tower overlooking the Jakarta skyline. It was just awesome, Brilliant. but you know, we were running the event, but all around us, you know, we, you know, you're used to having those sort of workshops in quiet auditoriums where, <laughs> but this was anything but, you know, there's lots of noise and activity around us. Of course, it was an active, vibrant you know, environment that we we're in and we loved it. And, um, you know, that's, that's really what it, what it's all about. That's what the current environment is. And, you know, you can tap into those guys. Mm. You're only, a, you know, you LinkedIn is an amazing resource. It's amazing who you can find on LinkedIn and just, you know, finding people with common interests, you know, start up a dialogue and a conversation. Um, you know, some of the organizations I've mentioned, the Indonesian Young Entrepreneurs Association, other co-working associations, whatever, you know, they're all open to talk about um, collaborations and, and things. And, you know, what, one of the things I'm also excited about is this concept of micro multinationals, uh, which is, you know, a couple of guys in their off the uh, garage in Perth linked up with some people in Indonesia or, and, and all around the globe. You know, can collaboratively do amazing things you know and you, you start up this cross-border you know business um just via the internet mm. so you know there's there's unlimited opportunity um it really just is down to 
you know, creativity and, and effort. You know, of course, doing a plug for our own organization. Obviously, we've got fantastic <laughs> networks. Uh, you know, you know I, I guess um, they've always got them, I guess. You've always got the, the government avenues. You know, the West Australian government has an office in Jakarta and, and an outpost in Surabaya in East Java where we have a sister state relationship. Austrade, the embassy. You know, there's a tremendous number of resources that people can tap into if that's what they they, they want, to, want to do. So, um, you know, having a chat with me is obviously a very good start because uh, <laughs> if there's, you know, that's cool. I can yeah. pretty much get to anyone. So, um which is a good thing. What's, what's your, apart from talking to you, what's your quick tips for networking in Indonesia? Is it like um, join the mem- private member clubs or? Um, well, yeah, well, we don't. How, do, how does an Australian start? Uh, apart apart well, from talking to you, which obviously is the smarter, quicker That's the route. smartest, the best way. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, maybe yeah, they joining wanna, or, well, maybe joining they want to go on an adventure and get lost in. Well, but you can do that too. That's exactly right. Get on a, well, under normal circumstances, get on yeah. a plane and go there and meet people. And just hang out in cool places, um, you know that will work. And when look, and when we are able to travel again, I would recommend that absolutely get on a plane, go there, immerse yourself in that culture. Uh, you'll be amazed. Um, but in the meantime, there's still other things you can do. There are other organisations. There's the Australia Indonesia Youth Association, mm. uh, Bali Bahasa Indonesia Perth for people with an interest in the language as well. Mm-hmm. Um, through the universities, like you know, a lot of your uh, community are probably still students uh, and the like who study. You know, you'll find uh, you know Indonesian students or other a- Asian student clusters within the organisation. Again, with Indonesia, there's an Indonesian Students Association, and there's nothing wrong. And you know, a lot of those people you know who come here, particularly on Australia Award scholarship, you know, they're DFAT funded, they're highly competitive. So the people who get those, you know, they come out again, in that very Javanese way, they're very humble, very quiet, but often they've already on a, an accelerated talent identification program in some ministry or some business. And when they finish their studies here, they're going back home uh, to go into great things. You know, some of our alumni are back at uh, data analysts at Bukalapak. We had one featured on one of our webinars recently. Um, you know, and there's a whole range of Indonesian scientists and others that are in, in, you know, at all of our universities are around town. So, you know, just through conversation with people, you build those sorts of sorts of networks um, quite quite easily if you seek them out. It's not Coming hard. back a bit, um, you mentioned uh, you know LinkedIn, social media, connecting people digitally since it's a bit hard to do it in person now. Hmm. So, outside of WhatsApp, the de facto communication platform for Indonesia, which I'm yeah. <laughs> which I'm very aware of. Uh, what about the ones that we use in Australia? So we got Facebook, LinkedIn, you know, all that kind of stuff for yeah. um, for business. Is it the same over there as well? Pretty pretty much, you know. In, in, apparently, Instagram is king. Um, mm. I, I I'm not an Instagram person myself, <laughs> but I do begrudgingly use some of those other platforms. WhatsApp, yeah. you know, I'm a, I'm a prolific WhatsApp user. I think I'm setting up a new WhatsApp chat group, you know, at least twice a day. Wow. Um, and you know but all of those platforms are, are useful so you know looks so traditionally you know, in the last few years we've always talked about uh, twitter being the you know twitter traffic in jakarta is number one in the world um facebook number four in the world instagram mm. is up there so all of those platforms are, are widely widely used yeah probably linkedin less so in terms of more social stuff but you know yeah. for business business connections it's a, an invaluable invaluable tool I suppose um, any uh, Indonesian business person on LinkedIn is probably more open to uh, working with people in Australia. Yeah. And and I do that often. I must admit when I first got onto LinkedIn, I was a bit um, picky. I know that sounds terrible, but I mean, you know, I made sure that, you know, I was, I was really under connections. Sorry. Well, exactly. But now, (laughs) you know, when, when um, people come across my radar, if I'm looking for people in particular sectors or whatever, I'll quite happily um, invite people to join, you know, join my network um, if there's a, a reason. But, you know, into, here's my, you know, rule 101 of LinkedIn. Um, I generally don't accept LinkedIn invitations for people who are so lazy that they just send me, a, oh, I'd like to join your network. Yeah, of course. Um, I'll always check out people's profiles um, mm. and just see that there's some sort of common thread that makes sense. Um, but, you know, if there's no obvious connection and it just looks like almost like a phishing scam, I, I, mm. I don't 
accept those. But likewise, you know, when I when I do reach out to people I don't know, I'll always make sure I send a very customized and personal message to a person explaining exactly what the context is, you know, mm -hmm. what it is I find interesting about what they do, where I see there could be some synergies. You know, I'm not saying you get 100% success rate still, but uh, it's pretty good. It's probably 95%. Uh, so you can really build a very useful network and, and LinkedIn, you know, you guys uh, are active on LinkedIn with, with your postings and the like, and I, you mm -hmm. probably get very good reach and exposure with that. So again, by putting timely good contact, and if you've already seen, you know, cultivated that network, you know, you really can um, build a, a very powerful and influential network with, you know, not a huge amount of effort. Mm -hmm. You just have to be, uh, I think, genuine. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and, and don't pitch people. Like I, I, so many people connect with me on LinkedIn and then the first message is a pitch. I'm like, yeah. I'm not interested. <laughs> yeah, I think yeah. someone needs to school these people. Well, yeah. you do. Calm down, I, get uh, to know me first. Uh, I, I must admit, I generally don't respond to those sorts of Me sorts of people. Same, but I, yeah. but I, at the same time, I resist the urge to disconnect them. Um, I figure, <laughs> look, you know, if if that's your bad behaviour, then that's not going to serve you well in 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 achieving the things you want to achieve. So good luck to you. But you know, look, I'll concentrate on on the genuine people, and, mm. and that's what I seek out. You know, I pe uh, seek out people who are passionate about what they do and genuine about what they do. And and you soon um, wear thin of people who are just takers. You know, I've, yeah. again, on that sort of networking, you know, I've always been a fan of, of genuine networking and, and of people. And I, um, you know, I like to consider myself a, uh, a connector or, or whatever. You know, I have a very large network and, and sometimes you'll get people who, who figure, oh, look, if I know Phil, look what access I get to all of these people in Phil's <laughs> network. And, you know, I, I'm, you know I'm a, I like to help people. That's my natural instinct. But I soon get sick of people who uh, just seem to want to be friendly to make, you know, tap into your knowledge, IP and your networks. You know, you sort of get caught out once. But you don't get out, caught out twice or three times. Um, so, but unfortunately, there are people um, that, are, that are wired that way. But, you know, you soon find them out. And, and, and look, yeah. there's enough genuine people out there that you don't need to worry about the others. Yeah, I think so. And, and in business, that helping people and giving first I, I, is an indicator of a successful business person. Yeah. 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 Well, so I, that, I, yeah, I, sorry, I, I keep cutting in, but you're mm -hmm. right. You know, and this, this modern concept of paying things forward is such, mm -hmm. you know, and that, that sense of karma as well. And, you know, but it's just basic human um, behavior, I suppose. You know, again, mm -hmm. when I, when I meet people for, a, you know, the first time when I meet somebody for a cup of coffee, we'll talk about blah, 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 blah. You know, you bounce a few ideas around. I'll always say, okay, I don't like to talk to people just for the sake of talking. I enjoy that, but mm. what are we going to do? Yeah. Uh, and even if we've just got a small action list of two or three little things that you go away and do, it's I'm going to pass on an int introduction or something, and and deliberately put something on the table. You know, I think that if you make an investment, you now unsolicited investment in a relationship, it's a very good investment. Mm. If you can help somebody out in some way, you've you've now got you know, an asset in the bank of, you know, goodwill, I suppose, that you can draw down at some future time. And I guess that's how, uh, you know, I, I suggest people operate that, mm -hmm. um, you know, particularly when you, when you develop larger networks, it's impossible to interact with thousands of people on a daily basis. Um, you know, I, again, my own recommendation is to, at every opportunity, leave a relationship on a high of some description. So when you come back six months later or a year later, that person's likely to pick up the call when your name <laughs> pops up on, on their phone, not, you know, sort of, sorry, can I take this call? Um, There's a leave everyone, leave, the, leave them feeling a little better off than before you got yeah. involved with them. Yeah, uh, absolutely. You know, always add, value, always add value. You know, that's, that's, that's one of my um, personal values, I guess, is to always add value. You know, if there's an opportunity to help somebody do it, you know, and I, I, I'd extend that, um, Example, if somebody rings you with the wrong number, if somebody rings me the wrong number, I'll look up the right number and I give it to them. I don't oh. say, yeah. <laughs> That's well, interesting. Yeah, well, it's crazy too, but um, no, I, <laughs> I, 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 and you know, I'm I, sorry to harp on about my philosophies, but again, no, no, I, 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 I'm, I, I'm, I'm interested. 
I, I remember years ago, I was involved in a, a personal development program where part of it, people had, you know, when in the introductory session, people were asked to make some sort of a commitment, how they were going to improve themselves through this process. And, mm -hmm. you know, people were often talking about their health, you know, their exercise, their diet or other things they were going to do better. And, and again, part of the exercise was for people to commit that they were going to do ABC. And then they would ask somebody else in the class and say, well, look, who's going to ring John up at, at five o'clock in the morning and make sure that he's out there jogging as he says he's <laughs> going to do better. So this was going around the room and it was becoming quite predictable. People were going to say they're going to do this and then somebody else say, oh, I'll do that. I remember one guy very clearly, and I, I, I'm sure he wouldn't mind me mentioning his name, a gentleman by the name of Jeff Mazzini. He ran his own training business. And this is 20 years ago, but I can remember it as clear as it was yesterday. And Jeff was asked what he was going to do. And he, he again, committed to improving his health and well-being and things like that. And then when they said, well, okay, now who's going to ring Jeff at six o'clock uh, and make, you know, check that he's doing it. And before anybody could answer, Jeff said, I'm going to make that call. Hmm. And what, it, what, what that indicated, he was taking personal responsibility for what he said he was going to do. So when you make a promise, you're making that promise to yourself. And when you don't deliver on it, you're letting yourself down. Hmm. And I find that very powerful. Um, because in my own uh, dealings with people, if I tell somebody I'm going to do it, I'm not telling John or Alex that I'm going to do it. I'm telling Phil I'm going to do it. Mm -hmm. So until I do what I say I'm going to do, I'm not being true to myself. And that's very compelling to the point I feel physically uncomfortable if I haven't done it. So I don't know. That's just my personal discipline. And I can look, I, with a lot of things going on, I can't say that's 100.0% successful, but I think it's in the <laughs> high 90s. So, that's um, cool. It's, yeah. yeah. It's, it's and I'll imagine. always recover. Like if I do let somebody down like that, there's always an opportunity then to come back and, and, and fix that situation. And often in fixing the situation, you make the situation better anyway. Mm, yeah. So um, again, that's just a, a value which I've embraced. And I just found, you know, I'm not trying to impose it on anybody, but I find it very useful for myself. One question we need to ask you is, it, it, with the relationship between Indonesia and Australia, this is a two-pronged question. First, how important is it, um, Australia, to become closer to Indonesia, especially in you know, the current politics and, and perhaps even future politics? And how do we improve the way let's say Australia talks about Indonesia, specifically our media, and maybe our politicians are obviously don't really mm. like talking about politicians much. Uh -huh. um, but you know, it's, it's, it, it's, it's troubling that that is a potential roadblock and you must experience that quite mm. a bit. It, it is it's frustrating. And that has been a multi-pronged uh, question. You're right. Yeah. Um, look, you know, I, you know, I, we work very closely with the media. We have a very healthy relationship with the media on a lot of the things that we like to, to talk about. But I, I guess the, the reality is that often it's bad news stories that tend to sell newspapers. And, like, and I'm course, not yeah. limiting that to Indonesia, um, but often it's a sensational, terrible happening, which mm. you know, makes for best headlines and stuff. So I, I, I'm not critical of the media for, for that. Um, no, it's just yeah, natural, we, we like, I guess. Yeah. yeah. Well, look, we like to put our be, or look put forward a a very positive story in Indonesia. But I, I mm -hmm. guess it's a generational change again. You know, you can't uh, fix these things overnight. It really is just by day by day doing something different, which changes the conversation. And over time, you've created a new reality. So, do you have you know, a, a newsletter or something? The sharing those, you know, uh, Australian Indonesian business stories um, and partnerships. Well, we do have a newsletter with the um, with our association, which goes out monthly. I must admit, you know, there is a bit of um, uh, opinion piece around that, which often right. I'll, I'll create a lot of that. You know, a lot of mm -hmm. uh, treatment of our our events that we run around the run around the country and by virtual means at the moment, yeah. uh, and also you know, articles of, of topical interest in a range of things. But look, I'm, I must admit, we probably could do more and don't do enough in the people side of things. You know, mm. we obviously appreciate the importance of sports diplomacy and arts diplomacy and, and those other, other things. 
we, we generally leave um, the gentler topics to other groups. You know, my friend Ross Taylor, who runs the Indonesia Institute, also very passionate about Indonesia, does a lot of writing. Uh, and you're, if you read the West Australian, Ross seems to be in the paper every second day <laughs> with a good news story about Indonesia or a different right. perspective on Indonesia. Um, so he's certainly doing the best he can and we're very supportive of each other and what we do. But it's, it's really down to the conversations that you guys have in the street too. You know, the people you're interacting with and, you know, by osmosis, getting that different um, perspective uh, of Indonesia out there and it's you know and, and you talk yourself about your trip to Bandung and that mm. it staggers me sometimes you know meeting people how many Australians you know I, I, I said before counterintuitively that Australians don't really know Indonesia but a lot of Australians have had interesting Indonesia experiences mm. in their student days through their professional lives uh, or a whole range of different things but it, it seems to be like just little dots out there without the connection between yeah. them and I guess it is really just bringing that network together so that it, it becomes that sort of critical mass I suppose and then it, it, it'll fire so you know I, I'm always a glass half full person I'm optimistic that things are, are improving it won't be perfect overnight but but it's it, again it's I know it's an overused cliche but the journey is fun Mm -hmm. you know, people talk to me about the 10 years I've been working on this trade agreement, you know, how frustrating that must be. And I thought, yeah, okay. But I always kind of knew we'd get there. Mm -hmm. And and I just enjoyed the interactions along the way and all of the, the, the steps of the process rather than just the, and you know, I wouldn't say we're at the end of the journey yet. We've still got a long, long way to go to make it a success. Yeah, over the line. Yeah. Uh, so um, again, sorry, just to finish though, yeah, but you know, yeah, yep. a lot of our events, you know, people do ask that sort of question. That's mm -hmm. all, okay. How's this all going to change? And I, and we, we might be in a room, you know, a physical room of 300, 400 people um, or on a webinar today, we had one with a thousand people on it. Wow. And I pretty much That's say, to the, well, it wasn't yeah. pretty good. We had 1600 registrations for our uh, webinar today, which was, which was pretty good. Mm. Um, and I say to each person in the room, the future of this relationship is in your hands. It's about what you do when you leave this room. You know, it's up to you to take action. You can't just sit back and expect every, everyone else to do it. So um, final question. It's, it's, a, it's a, a real easy, real easy one, uh, softball. I've never been to Jakarta. So mm -hmm. when I actually arrive there, what's the first restaurant I should go to? Sky. It's uh, Sky's my favourite place in Jakarta. It's on the 56th floor of the Bacha Armanara Bank Tower. It's a it's a pretty funky, lively place. It's got you know panoramic views out over the city, horizon pool on the roof. If you get a nice, steamy um, Jakarta evening with a bit of uh, electrical storm action going, it's magic. So um, I'd certainly Great. recommend that. What's I'm your uh, What's your favourite What's your favourite dish from that place? Uh, from Indonesia, oh, I, love, I love a few different things. I'm a big fan of sop buntut, which is the oxtail soup, the nasi goreng, of course, but padang food, which is a lot of your wow. uh, rendangs. And, uh, but every, every part of Indonesia has its own unique specialty dish. So, so just exploring those. You know, there's, I can't remember the name, but in, um, in Jakarta they have a dish which is a lot sweeter. Uh, mm. The many. I'm, I'm not really a big fan of sweet food. Um, a little bit of spice is great, but there's such variety. It, it, it really is uh, wonderful. So just to be able to savor the all of the sights and sounds and flavors of Indonesia is just a, a delight. Mm. Right. Well, thanks so cool. much for talking to us, thanks. Phil. It's been it's been really really good, really enlightening. Um, how do people get in touch with you? How do they sign up to your newsletter? Um, well, our website is pretty simple. It's aibc.com.au. Great. On that, uh, you'll see some of our recent newsletters, some of the events we've got coming up. There is an opportunity to register for our newsletters or to become a member if you are so inclined. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and through that, you know, my email is president at aibc.com.au. So always happy to hear from, hear from anyone and help them out. And, you know, always love to you know, talk to people about Indonesia, of course. Great. All right. Excellent. Thank you so much. Thanks, Thanks Phil. guys. It's been a real pleasure. It really has. Thank you, Phil. Bye then. Cheers. All right. That's the end of this episode of Tech Society. Thanks for listening. It was great to chat to Phil about the Australia-Indonesia connection, as well as discover insights into the differences between business and culture between the two countries. Learn more about us at techsociety.fm and tweet us at techsociety.fm. 
if you have any comments you'd like to share. Ninja Software sponsors this episode, whom you can check out over at njs.dev.